The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Are you making the most of your KiwiSaver investment? Generate is an award-winning KiwiSaver provider with a track record of strong long-term performance. Making a smart decision now could add tens of thousands of dollars by the time you reach retirement. Book a no-obligation chat with a Generate KiwiSaver advisor today at generatekiwisaver.co.nz slash advice. A copy of the product disclosure statement is available at generatekiwisaver.co.nz. The issuer of the scheme is Generate Investment Management Limited and, of course, past performance does not guarantee future returns. I'm Toby Manhire and this is Juggernaut, the story of the fourth Labour government. A podcast in six parts. Doesn't give my opponents much time to run up to an election, does it? This nation is at risk. What do you think you're up to now, you perverted little liar? I can smell the uranium on it as you lean towards it. <laughs> There's a radical overhaul in the history of New Zealand's administration. Juggernaut, the story of the fourth Labour government. Made with the support of New Zealand On Air. Listen now on the spin-off or wherever you get your podcasts. Tēnā koutou katoa, this is Gone By Lunchtime and we are back in the studio at a long distance, like it's like it's like we're at all corners of a tennis court. Kia ora, Annabelle over there. Tēnā koe, Toby Manhire, far away over there. Ben Thomas. Hello. Tēnā koe. <laughs> Kia ora. <laughs> Tēnā koe, how are you doing? Kei te pohai. I can just make him out. He's like, <laughs> is it really T.I.? <laughs> what is a question we could ask him that only T.I. wouldn't know the answer to? Maybe which pod won the most awards at the New Zealand Podcast Awards? <laughs> was, was it the Mike Hoskin <laughs> breakfast? Oh, that's, that's a bit hurtful. <laughs> well, that's a little, right bit, a little bit hurtful. Right was, it, was it Radio New Zealand concert? <laughs> the entire station? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, Tuesday, July the 3rd, just the full 24 hours on the concert program has won the New Zealand Podcast Award. Their entry was like, their entry was 40 years of acetate discs (laughs) mailed in to to the extremely real New Zealand Podcast Awards. Now listen. Definitely not just like a... (laughs) A postal address in Papakura and a Twitter account that then solicited commercial funding. <laughs> we have got important things to get to, so let's not mess around on that sort of stuff. Let's get right to it. Annabelle, uh, pigeons. What is the latest? There have been developments. Last we spoke, a pigeon had been impaled on your property or nearby. You rescued it. Um, then the pigeon community... Uh, gathered around you and sort of turned you into their god. Is that roughly the sum of it? Yep, that's pretty much exactly what happened and they'd come in and worship in my house every day by crapping everywhere. And then it sort of became like a Goldilocks situation where I'd walk in and there'd literally be one sitting in my husband's chair at the dinner (laughs) table or one in my bedroom. Mm. And at first it was like cute and fun and then it started to feel like invasive mm. so what I realised is I needed like my own Tetai Tokido border control situation going on <laughs> so what I did is I got my Yui Boom and started playing Tui calls out on my deck mm. which totally racked up all the Tuis in the neighbourhood they literally <laughs> puff up to like four times their normal size <laughs> and I bought a Tui feeder on Trade Me so, yeah. so they're going to start patrolling the house for me from the invading pigeon wow. army. This wow. is this is like the story I read, you know, in the in the nineties before the internet made it easier to sort of fact check things. You know, in the inter, in the Herald's international section, and it said, you know, there's been a problem with an overrunning of monkeys in a state parliament in India. So the solution was to get like a band of larger monkeys to come in and like <laughs> chase them out. <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe some tigers would be helpful in that situation. I mean, this is basically the history of New Zealand ecology, right? Mm. <laughs> well, yeah, no, it's definitely a, it's definitely a kind of um, powerful science exercise you're undertaking. And about what is the latest? The two you've currently got a lot of angry, horny tuis surrounding your whare protecting it from the pigeon invasion. They just fly around the house because okay. they hear these these other toy calls that don't belong in the neighbourhood and oh, then see. they're like 
what's going on. So then they start circling my house mm. and that seems to be enough to put the pigeons off coming in and, you know, dining at my kitchen table and taking little nana naps in my bedroom and stuff. But no further pigeon murder? No further pigeon murder, although I have to say, you know, after they started invading my house regularly and often, a picture started to form in my mind about <laughs> why perhaps Pene Te Kura was impaled mm. in the first mm. place. Mm. <laughs> and this is all a powerful metaphor for what, Ben, O King of the Extended Metaphor? What particular component of contemporary New Zealand political life does the story of the paled pigeon and the swarms of tuis, flocks of tuis, the tui invasion capture? Is it about vaccine mandates? Yes. Um, to, so we are talking today on Tuesday, November the 16th uh, on our, in our tennis court studio. And I think of it as more as a, a lounge. More of a lounge. Yeah, without the extractor fan overhead for our cigar smoke. It's unusual because fumes. normally we um, sit at a table. Um, I'm painting you a picture, ladies and gentlemen, but now we're sort of reclined towards the back corners of the room and it does somehow affect the general tenor of the conversation, doesn't it? Already I feel like I'm reading a bedtime story to mm. a child. Mm. <laughs> I feel like I'm on like some old school like TVNZ show hosted by what was his name Peter Sinclair. Peter Sinclair. Where you talk about books and <laughs> taste brandy and mm. smoke a cigar. Mm. I, I f- yeah, I, f- I feel like I feel like we're in, in the Northern Club, charting the GDP figures for the next year and mm. decide, deciding what the unemployment rate will be next September. Um, Tomorrow is Wednesday, that's for sure. And tomorrow is the day where we are expecting to get the long-awaited announcement around the Auckland border and quite how the, 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 the there's been an undertaking given several times now um, from the Prime Minister down that Aucklanders will be allowed to exit the region for Christmas to go and do whatever it is they want to do at Christmas. Uh, there has been a bit of a kind of... Ugh, Confusion. It's been. It's not been happy times for the government with uh, backing and forthing around whether or not there might be uh, slots given to people. You know, like waiting at a busy deli counter or whatever. And it sounds as though they have landed on uh, doing spot checks. It sounds as though that everyone will need to be vaccinated doing spot checks, and uh, rather than trying to check every single car exiting at the Bombay Hills and also Annabelle that they will what it sounds as though they're going to look at instead is creating some kind of protection or restriction in the parts of the country that have not reached a level of vaccination which at this point we're probably looking about looking at the west coast to the south island the east coast to the north island (coughs) type thing what do you make of all that? I think it's kind of a a dangerous strategy for the government or a high-risk strategy because I, I think they've very much developed the expectation now that Aucklanders will get to leave, mm. you know, through whatever mechanisms they put pl- in place and that, you know, there's going to be a greater easing of restrictions and all of those sorts of things. But we really don't know how bad COVID is going to be by the time we get there, and, you know, today Rawiri Taunui is predicting we'll be getting, you know, there'll be 6,000 Māori infections by by Christmas. So it, it doesn't leave them much room to be able to wind things back um, if we're at a point where contact tracing, hospitals and all of that are completely overwhelmed. And it's been, it's, it's, it's sort of, it's become confused as well in, in a lot of minds, understandably, probably yours too, because there's at the same time the question about when the traffic light system is introduced. It's probably, there's going to be this meeting on November the 29th and there is a um, suggestion which was um, <coughs> floated, uh, I think, by the Prime Minister and uh, into uh, Joe Moyer, who's on fire for newsroom at the moment about whether or not the whole country could mm. could be could be expedited into the traffic light system. Yeah, and, and in her uh, press conference yesterday, dropped pretty strong hints that would be the case. Mm. That um, 
uh, and and the reason you know the thinking behind this is sort of twofold. The expressed reason is that if we do have cases circulating around the country, and they already are, you know, we're, we're seeing cases pop up in uh, Woodville, mm. in the Wairarapa, uh, Taranaki, you know, Taupo, Taupo, um, and if COVID is in the community, how, however it got there you are safer having these sort of, you know, the vaccine mandates in place, or so rather the vaccine passport system in place, yeah. opening up more for, you know, people who are vaccinated than for people who are not vaccinated, um, which uh, the current alert level system doesn't do at level two around the country. It's much more sort of, uh, there's fewer gradations and shades of grey in there. You're either basically living as normal in level two, as most of New Zealand is now, or you're in a level three lockdown, an eternal present, which never ends, just a sort of miasma of images that may have happened 13 weeks ago or five years ago or yesterday, and we just don't know. Um, And so the second reason is that, um, you know, because life is actually pretty easy if you're unvaccinated in level two, there's no real incentive um, if, if you're if you're vaccine hesitant, if you're anti-vaccine, uh, or if you're just not engaged, um, which is you know a lot of the people who are vaccinated right now, uh, th- there's no real driver to hurry up and get your jab uh, because life carries on pretty much as normal in most of these areas. So you know there's a bit of a you know carrot and stick, double duty, as the prime minister might like to say. Um, in moving everyone into that traffic light system when Auckland goes in, uh, which you know also makes sense because as soon as uh, the border opens, you know it's pretty much it's pretty much all on, all on for young and old. Yeah, and I, I mean Andrew Little said on New Sub Nation on Saturday and about that he used the term that COVID will wash through the country, which is which is which is sounds as, very as, cleansing, which is which is just. <laughs> Just true, Could isn't be it? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, a gentle, sort of su- <laughs> sussy kind of. But it, but it is gonna, it is gonna, you know, ripple, seep, spread, whatever you want, whatever you want to call it. Let's let's uh, let's accept that. Um, and as you just touched on, that is going to arrive in parts of the country that don't have the resources, facilities um, that Auckland that Auckland does. Um, uh, I want to talk about self-isolation in a minute, but I spoke yesterday for a piece to Kai Eagleton, who's a locum in, in Northland and a specialist on, on rural health at the University of Auckland. He was just talking about the access to resources, even even just getting a mobile signal in lots of parts of the country, mm. um, before you even start talking about uh, ambulance access and long waits for ambulances. I mean, that's, let alone ICU beds, it's it's a... It's it's there's a lot of unknowns that uh, await us in this around Christmas time, or, right? or even hospitals that don't have sewage leaking through the well, walls. Yeah. and yeah, I think you know uh, while we're sort of being groomed to prepare for this lovely sudsy um, uh, bathing in, in, in the COVID, like a dip in a cool spring to to <laughs> chill out after the the long Kiwi summer. Um, you know, the reality is, is that it's going to rip through um, poor, isolated communities that that aren't resourced um, to to deal with the health issues that they currently have, let alone the onslaught of um, of COVID. And the more we move away from a, a sort of what seems to, what was a science led approach which made it more um, predictable for people to know what the next thing was going to be we seem to be um, moving through alert level changes um, in a way that's contradictory to the expert advice that's coming from the modelers and all of that and I think that creates a greater sense of um, of unease and and uh, you know amongst ordinary people because then it becomes really hard to predict where, where we're going to go mm. and what's going to happen next. And and that's where the wheels have really fallen off. I think for in terms of the government's response, is just this sort of haze of uncertainty. Um, you know, we will we will never even get to see level three, stage three. 
<laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> like we're going to move yeah. into the traffic system. We might. We I, might. I don't think we will. I maybe think, just maybe uh, maybe like maybe six hours of it. Just to no, really because, no, like a five pm to eleven fifty nine pm situation. Just so a little bit of anti just can go the into the club <laughs> so <they can> for, <laughs> for like thirty minutes. <laughs> they get a chance to infect as many people as they can because fair's fair, and then they have to like leave. It's, I mean, I, I've said this, I've said this countless times before, so um, forgive me. But this is just what most of the world dealt with last year. Mm. You know, I mean, the UK was always, we've got this bit of restriction for the northeast and the, the southwest has this and the, all these incredibly mm. convoluted, overlapping, sometimes contradictory rules. That's just the kind of reality of dealing with COVID in the community when you don't have this exquisite clarity of a a, a lodestar that is elimination. The, the, right? the binary, do we have COVID, do we not have yeah. COVID, yeah. And 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 remember how much we made fun of all of those jurisdictions. Oh, yeah. And, we and, fucked and that and up, didn't them. we? Yeah, 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 yeah that's that hubris described. <laughs> um, and... Yeah, and, and this is the thing, is it, just in terms of sort of the individual psychology operating in the public, and, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I find myself sort of falling into the same thing, is that we've gotten used to over the past year and a half, or at least uh, up and probably even up until the last couple of months, thinking that opening up equals there is no more virus. And... And you see that around, you know, you see that around Auckland. Like, um, apart from K Road, where everyone is extremely judicious and ostentatious about wearing their masks, um, you know, there's very, very little mask use. Is there? <laughs> even, is there? Even, even, even in mm. the even in the leafy suburbs uh, that are my habitat in sort of central, you know, in the central you know, city fringe sort of thing. Um, yeah, not certainly not a lot of mask use from people out having their constitutionals. Mm. Um, Ponsonby Road, pretty, pretty, pretty variable. Once you get to Hearn Bay, well, oh, COVID's not allowed there. COVID can't afford the rent, so <laughs> it's just it's just active wear and bare faces, and um, and you know, and and from all reports, you know, I can't go to these places because we're in lockdown. But further afield, South Auckland, very low rates, and West Auckland as well. So. You know, people are acting as if we're opening up as if there's no virus, but actually there's more virus than there's ever been. (laughs) And I think the the COVID Christmas, you know, the traditional Kiwi Christmas narrative, you know, creates a really unrealistic expectation, like you say, that we're all going to be released like little Smurfs and we get to (laughs) run around the country having fun. But the reality is, is that, you know, the Kiwi Christmas this year for a lot of whānau Māori will mean, you know, doning your tangi blacks and sitting on yep. on um, on Zoom tangi for hours on end. And obviously it, it will affect other New Zealanders as well. well one other thing that's interesting that I noticed in Jacinda Ardern's um, morning report interview yesterday she said, now, you know, we've got to remember that for, for the vast majority of people who get COVID, the symptoms are mild to moderate. And I don't remember her saying that since March last year mm, mm. when we were still hearing about this overseas virus and is it going to hit New Zealand and, um, and, and mi- mild to moderate symptoms was sort of the, mm. the byword mm. around the world. Um, at that point, we didn't realise that mild to moderate described anything short of <laughs> hospital admission. <laughs> and, and, but, but again, that goes back to this. At that point, it was really straightforward to say mm. this is a terrible, terrible storm cloud that we must keep out at all costs. And now it's much more complicated and as you say, Annabelle, you have this... Because they were trying to use Christmas and festivals and ordinary Kiwi summer as the incentive, you know? This is, get your vaccines, do this. Um, And now they've gone and underwritten all these festivals because these festivals obviously are looking at the reality out there and going, there's no way we can (laughs) operate. But they've they've kind of locked themselves. And you kind of... I mean, mean, you look at Western Australia... um, which has said, nah, we're not opening up. We're not opening up till mm. January because we haven't got our vaccination rates high, high enough mm. yet. And obviously that's caused some consternation. Not everyone is happy about that. But not even for a compassionate exemption can you turn up in Perth from Sydney at the moment. They're just like, nah, sorry, we're not ready. And I wonder whether, in retrospect, it might have been better to say, this is really hard, everybody. 
Christmas, it's not going to be an ordinary Kiwi Christmas. Yeah. And, and, and the thing too is, if we're to look what's happened overseas, actually, it's probably going to get worse. Like when, when winter comes, when schools reopen, when everybody heads back indoors into their offices and stuff, we'll probably, what will happen here is exactly what's happened overseas. What's happening despite, now in despite, Europe. Yeah, what's happening now in Europe with surging COVID Fourth cases it, it's yeah. despite vaccination it? rates. It, it, it's extraordinary that... Um, this is, I think, this is something really characteristic about New Zealand that we during like we always forget that winter happens. You know, during we, we think there's a great John Summers essay about yeah, that that we, he wrote for the for the spinoff <laughs> last year about every year it's like what's this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is quite unseasonal <laughs> rain and cold. Uh, um, but but it, weirdly enough, that kind of seasonal amnesia has affected the entire world now. You know, because every. Mm as we've seen now, because we've been through a few cycles, during summer, COVID cases drop basically to nil. Well, not to nil, but, you know, very, very low. Mm. And people go, oh, we've cracked it. <laughs> and then winter, when people get <laughs> respiratory illnesses, comes around, and then cases skyrocket again, and people are like, what? And, and you, 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 you touched on this, Ben, but I do think there is some, <laughs> some, some quite myopic commentary that comes from some, and certainly not all, but some members of the quote-unquote business community in terms of the return. We just want to return to normal, which is, what normal is that? Yeah, exactly. that that's off the table, You right? know, the, I mean, yeah. get real, have a anymore. look. Do you, you know, are you, are you, you know, have a look at Google News, type in COVID, and, you know, <laughs> around the world, like, and, you know, I mean, they're going back into lockdown in Holland. They're, 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 in Austria, they're, they're locking down Two only million, va- unvaccinated yeah. people. It's it's the back to normal is not a is not a thing, and if you try and if you try and accelerate to that too quickly, then the consequences are incredibly serious. But but the thing is, opening up in New Zealand is you know do, the thing is we want to do it during summer. We want to use summer as the time for getting everyone vaccinated because look, and this is this is this is going to sound really awful. Um, nothing accelerates vaccination like COVID in the community. As soon as you get COVID cases in an area, vaccination rates really start rocketing up. And if we're going to get to um, if we're going to get to ninety percent across the country, it would be better for that to happen and for COVID to seed in small numbers during summer when it's much much harder to transmit um, than during winter. You know, if, if we, you know. Henry Cook's written a lot about this it's, uh, stuff. You know, the, when you drill into the numbers, the vaccination rates, you know, have really, you know, they've, they've slowed significantly. And but but where you do get an impetus is where there are new cases in the community. Um, if 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 we just go sort of BAU and sort of wait for people to take their time. Yeah, even leaving aside the economic, the social consequences, I don't know that many people I know could do another thirteen weeks of lockdown in Auckland, um, but. Uh, even leaving aside that, there's no guarantee that you'll actually get to 90% um, by June next year. And if you do, and then you open up, it'd be much worse than if we do it now um, in terms of, you know, literally just the environmental conditions for it. So, you know, I I, I don't know. You know, the the government's presented with a lot of imperfect choices, um, but this isn't a crazy one, right? Yeah, and important to remember too that when we say 90%, you know, we are simply talking about the general population Mm. and obviously that level will be significantly Mm. lower Mm. for Māori and will have a devastating impact on our people. And and also 90% is not what was being said by by many of the the health experts as well. Yeah. I mean, I'm not... Unlike you guys, an epidemiologist, but I am an I am an immunologist and a manicurist, <laughs> and I think it, you know a podiatrist and that I vexillologist. Think. I yeah, that's my main job. Obviously, I'm just mm. a, a hobby pedicurist sometimes, but only in the weekends. Um, that you know, a 95 percent target for for Maori is um, w- would have made a huge difference, and if that's not what it is, we're going to see. A lot of um, far no and that is in tangy is, mode over the next year, and I think twenty twenty three is going to be a particularly terrible year for our people. That's what's playing out in Germany at the moment. 
because uh, in parts of what was Eastern Germany, and there are particular pockets of population, so it might it's it's, it's fine to have an across the board percentage, even within a particular mm-hmm. area. But if there are particular parts of the community that are um, underrepresented in those in those in those higher vaccination rates, then then you've got then you've got serious serious problems. So yeah, and, yeah. and all of this comes back to the just almost criminal neglect. Um, in terms of the vaccine rollout early on, um, where you know there was there was no there was no provision made, the policy analysts in Wellington just didn't even seem aware that there were people that you couldn't reach by sending a fridge magnet to a house and you know announcing something at the PM's one PM presser, um, and and it just shows you know if we you know going back the great work Tina Nata's doing um, on the east coast you know having to. You know, having to go cap in hand and crowdfund a mobile vaccination clinic. Now, the government's taken some steps to address that recently, but, you know, it's... Um, and, you know, there'll be an accounting for that. There, there, you know, there, there has to be a royal commission, um, you know, sometime reasonably, you know, probably mm. in the next year or so. Totally. Um, but I think there has to be a royal commission, even if even if the if it had be, if it had gone oh, course, yeah. <laughs> really well from the start, it's something of this size needs to have a royal commission. It seems to me obvious. I want to um, just move on quickly onto the 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 isolating at home uh, story because we've now got two thousand people and and I think I think I think two thousand people across Waikato and Tamaki Makoto who are isolating at home, COVID positive, and, and, and two thousand. 2,000 close contacts isolating at home. Yeah. A lot of whom are family members, and I'm like, wait, are they just... Yeah. Are they just there waiting to get it pretty from much. there? Like, pretty, 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 uh, pretty much. Yeah. And, 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 and well, I mean, you know, that's not that's not the worst thing in the world. The, no, 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 sure, that, yeah. that sort of the, the Delta does that. And if if they're being looked after and 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 and, and, and safe, comfortable yeah. circumstances, that's worse than them being yeah. out and about. Now, now that's now, the spe- question, right? Well, spe- spe- speaking of that, uh, uh, a birthday shout out to pod listener Megan Rose. Uh, who How did we has no? That was a weird who, segue. Yeah. No, no. Who, who, who has she been, isolating? No, she's been delivering groceries Aww. to the people who are self isolating. Oh, happy birthday, girl! Oh, so, well done. Well done. Yeah, no, that's, um, um, big, which is something I didn't actually realise was doing. Uh, the Student Volunteer Army. Anyone remember them? Oh yes. is, yeah, yeah, love it's, those it's coordinating, guys. Coordinating uh, deliveries to people in self isolation Very who good. can't arrange. Really um, groceries and food supplies oh, for themselves. That's extremely cool. That's extremely um, which cool. I think touches on what you were about to get to. Well, which they is... might m- p- perhaps drop off some pulse oximeters, which don't. The, <laughs> That'd the be regional, helpful. Regional <laughs> health That'd providers seem to be struggling with some burner phones. We, we, I mean, Andrew, little I mean, it's, them. <laughs> it's 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 obviously there are two parts where there have been three deaths, and the circumstances of those deaths are not known for sure yet. So we have to be really careful about what those are ascribed to. But three people have died in their homes while self-isolating with COVID. One of those cases, really quite a heartbreaking story, was told by the family to both the Herald and to News Hub about the, their 60-year-old father, uh, who's an imam at a local mosque and who'd been coughing up blood. And, you know, the, we, 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 we don't have all the details of it, but on the face of it, it's pretty, pretty shocking. And... Uh, uh, yesterday, the Health and Disability Commissioner told me that she had written to the Ministry of Health last week, demanding urgent attention be paid to the level of care. Because on another layer, and we've had we've had people contact us at the spin-off too, um, describing cases where people had said, "I want to go into MIQ," or I, "Where's my pulse oximeter?" or just not getting the kind of clinical attention at the outset, because clearly the regional public health service is backlogged they're under a huge amount of pressure and it just it just it, i mean uh i the thing that kind of really flummoxes me is this was not something that was unpredictable this is something that could have been surely should have been foreseen yeah look and I mean, we can say that in so many areas, vaccine certificates are you know are barely ready. Um, you know the, the the fact that the 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 change the shift from mandatory MIQ for positive cases to isolating in the home, that announcement, you know, as my former colleague and good friend Matthew Hooten pointed out in his column, that announcement was never actually made 
it just happened. Chris Hipkins said, oh, in, as time goes by, we will move towards this. Yeah. But he never said, this is the day that we're just telling people there's no... No, no he, he did say, we're now moving to default that, yes. But it wasn't, it wasn't addressed at the top of a press conference or in a press release. It was, it was, a, it was, it was a little more of a crossfade. I, I think it was, yeah, I, th- yeah, I, th- I think it was, almost, it was always a sort of, our, our intention will be to, and that, that was definitely what I picked up he from He specifically it, said we, the words, we are now moving to, by default, putting yeah, people in self yeah, mo- Moving to. Or something. Anyway, yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah so it's tonal. But, yeah. um, you know, which is a pretty significant shift, right? I think mm. most people were surprised when For they sure. found out that there were a thousand cases just, mm. yeah. just at home. And this is the second, you know, this is another layer. You know, it's a truism that uh, disasters and cr- uh, humanitarian crises always affect the poor worst. Um, the poor is a very broad shorthand for people who are lacking in social capital because, first of all, um, you know, it's well canvassed. Um, Māori in particular and also Pacifica uh, vaccination rates are very low or, you know, much lower. But then second of all, you know, we, we spend a lot of time, you know, uh, in, in, in the culture talking about, you know, Karens and people who are insistent and, oh, I talk to the ma- you know, I want to talk to the manager. And the thing is, if if you don't have that attitude when you're dealing with the public service, in a lot of cases, you disappear and you get shunted to the back of the queue. If you're polite, if you wait your turn, if you're not basically demanding special treatment, you are, you get forgotten about. And so cultures, you know, we saw this years ago with the Muliainga case where a woman died uh, because her life support was cut off by Mercury Energy because she was behind on power bills. And, you know, it, it, you know, cu- culturally, she and her family, you know, were, were, didn't, you know, were, were, were reticent about sort of going how, you know, they, they, didn't have, they didn't have John Campbell on speed dial. They didn't have the media to talk to. They just said, oh, okay, could you rethink it? You know, and, and eventually, you know, a tragedy occurred. Um, it's and, actually that's like such a, a a lethal part of institutional racism yeah. is the conditioning of those communities to not ask because from childhood they are taught by the system that if you ask you will be denied and so over a lifetime that accumulates to these really life threatening situations where you. Um, although it doesn't sound like that was necessarily the case with the with um, the that person. Well, I, think, well, I, think, well, well, I think there was there was some suggestion that he didn't they... like to that he was said the the suggestion is that there was said to him if you want an, want an ambulance we can see you and he was like yeah. my my I don't want to be in trouble. My yeah. inference that it was a bit like oh no I don't want to make a scene. I got the impression that's, that his that's kids were, were were able well you know willing to advocate on his behalf. But again, it's all the same thing that their condition. Yes. To not ask because you're not worthy and you will not get it. And I, I think, you know, we're moving into such a dangerous part of the virus now because I'm I'm really concerned that Maori, Pacifica, minority communities are not going to get the access to the healthcare that they need because of that. Not only because the system actively says no to them, but also because, like you said, they've been conditioned to know that they're not allowed to ask because they're not worthy, essentially. Yeah, it's you know it's 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 it, you know it's it's a horrible fact that um, yeah, pu- pushy middle class Pakeha will always get what they need from the system, and other groups will always struggle. Um, and that, and that you know and that becomes a real big problem with the health response right now with COVID in the community when you're when you're you're basically getting and and you know and then there's all the other levels right you know isolating in your home in Hearn Bay you know in your four bedroom home with you know you and your partner say is very different from isolating in a two family home in South Auckland uh, you know it's certainly different from isolating in you know substandard housing on the east coast um you know where you're a long you might be a long long way away from a supermarket and there's no student volunteers to bring you food right um and so uh, again you know you would hope that people on the ground had been working on these issues i'm real pessimistic 
And, and that's why, you know, the tina ngatas of the world and the huni harawedas who, who are, drop, you know, dropping off kai and stuff to people, you know, thank God we have them. It shouldn't be up to them to do it. But if it's going to be, give them whatever they want. Yeah, that's no right. questions asked. It, it, it if you're should. not going to do it as the state who actually should be doing it, then just give those people whatever they ask for and let them get out of the way and let them get on with it. This is Gone By Lunchtime. We will be back in a tick. Talo for lover. I'm Madeline Chapman, editor at The Spin-Off. If you have the means, consider supporting our high-quality journalism by becoming a Spin-Off member. Sign up now at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. This is Climate Adaptation. We are the Portiki of the Tile. And the words of those keeping the home fires burning. It's more than just going along and planting some trees. You've got to be able to defend that place to the end of your life. We have the solutions. We just need to come back to the belief in ourselves as rangatira. Join me, Nadine Huda and Ruia Apirehama, the Kopapa Korangi Series 2 Ahika. Brought to you by Te Komato Te Tonga, the Deep South Challenge. Out now on the Spin-Off Podcast Network or wherever you get your podcasts. This week is the uh, mandate week, you know, the the mandates for vaccination for health workers and teachers kicked in. Um, and uh, schools return tomorrow, Annabelle. Um, the part of that related to that is there was a big protest at Parliament last week it was a weird kind of conflation, a strange coalition of different everything from people who uh, feel that vaccination's okay but mandates are unacceptable to people who think COVID's a hoax to people who think that Jacinda Ardern is in an ankle bracelet um, and being kept prisoner by the deep state. I think I'm not sure even the details there. Some strange, speaking of vexillology, some strange appropriation of flags, um, some threats of death against politicians and members of the media, just a strange... I, I, um, I go back and forth on this a bit, Annabelle, in terms of sometimes when you go into the, the telegrams and some of the Facebook groups and read some of the messages, and there's some pretty serious violent threats there, um, you start kind of feeling extremely concerned about the, <laughs> the state of the country. And then you kind of go out for a walk and you go, well, this is a very small minority and there are some people who are, have, you know, reasonable concerns and <clears throat> have had historical uh, uh, reasons for being suspicious of the state, blah, blah, blah. What is the right level of proportion to apply to this movement, this stuff? Well, I think, you know... They are a, a very small minority right now, um, but they are dangerous and they are growing. Um, and some of the language that's being used, you know, the tennis balls with hang Jacinda and that, I think, you know, is deeply, deeply troubling. Um, you know, personally, I used to think that the the worst act of theft from Māori was when you steal papa and you pretend to be Māori. Mm. But having witnessed the the theft of Māori resistance symbols or the hijacking of Māori resistance symbols through this movement, I have to say, given the terrible threat that, you know... Um, that COVID poses for Māori communities, that this has to be one of the most awful forms of, you know, misappropriation of um, taonga Māori. One of the things that blows me away, and I heard, you know, Tauhinari and Shane Te Pau talking about this last week, is, you know, the, the state's response to, for example, the, the, um, the, the, the Urewera raid... Um, over a couple of silly text messages and whatnot, as opposed to these people who are publicly threatening the Prime Minister, or, or, or even to use a more recent example, like the police going in and raiding the little camp at Putiki Bay at the start of at the start of this lockdown, as opposed to the response to these increasingly threatening protests just 
is really hard to understand. Yeah, I would be very surprised if a number of those protest organisers are not sort of being paid close attention to by the security um, services, um, particularly in light of what we've seen in the UK. Um, you know, I mean, how many how many murders of MPs have they had? They've had a couple in the last... Two MPs have been murdered, yeah. yeah. And... You know, I, I certainly don't think any. I, I certainly don't think the authorities at that level will be taking um, them lightly. Uh, the policing does seem a little hands off, um, and maybe I presume that that's an effort to kind of you know de-escalate tension, lower the temperature, which is usually the the, the preference of the New Zealand police, especially when you get large, you know, if you get large groups of people. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. As, as a former teen edge lord, uh, libertarian, you know, I, I part of me sort of thinks, oh yeah, they're, they're my people, not not the ones with nooses and stuff, you know, but the, <laughs> the one, not the Q and on ones, but the you know, the, 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 <laughs> not the not the M I Q and on Yeah, like, yeah. like the but, chemtrail ones <laughs> or the ten eighty ones. Yeah, what are those things? Are you saying home security uh, services playing close attention uh, to people like this? <laughs> ben, what's your home address? No, uh, no, but I, but I mean, like the you know the people who are talking about you know the sort of state overreach with vaccine mandates and things. Like, I don't agree with them, but I can see, I actually do see where they're coming from. You know, part of me sort of bristles when I hear the Prime Minister saying, oh, you know, if everyone gets vaccinated, we'll allow you more freedoms. And I sort of think that's not how I understand my relationship with the state, you know. So philosophically, I sort, I sort of get, you know, um, where, where, you know, the, the more mainstream sort of attendees of these protests are coming from. Um, I don't think they're right in terms of vaccine mandates. I think we're, we're in extraordinary times and, and there are, you know, there are always, there have to be limits. Um, you know, even the most ardent libertarians believe that, you know, emergency situations and disaster management, you know, requires a bit of uh, centralisation. But, yeah, the, 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 the creeping in of this just absolutely crazed element eh? and the and it's something that's I've, I've sort of noticed um, you know kind of slowly over the maybe the last five or six years that you know and, and you see it with like you know people's people's dads and you know <laughs> friends of your uncles and things mm. like that and, mm. and they'll they'll say something that you know you would have normally associated with your very online irony poisoned millennial friends you know you would think how does a boomer know about that you know you know how do they know about like you know these qanon memes and things and and you know a, a lot of a lot of uh, boomers seem to have hit retirement, spent a lot of time watching Fox News, start to decide to do their own research. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Trump obviously didn't help with the, this sort of thing because I think one of the, the the key drivers of sort of conspiratorial thinking is if they're amplified by people in power, which is a bit ironic, really, because you know conspiracy theorists like tend to think that. They don't, you know, they're skeptics who don't believe the establishment. But if their if their conspiracy theories are amplified by people in positions of official power, that makes them believe them more. So <laughs> it's, um, you know, are you suggesting there might be some logical inconsistency in some of these movements? Look, I, look, I, I think I think people should believe what they want, but. Um, but yeah, and it's and it sort of ramped up, and, the, and then you see the sort of public eruption of just absolutely bananas people, you know. Um, and and it's not, you know, it's not across one demographic either. You've got the sort of, you know, I, th- I think the I think the you know the appropriation of uh, hef, of the um, Hefakaputanga flag, you know, the Northern Chiefs Independence flag. Um, it's a really interesting one because in a lot of cases, you know, it's definitely been appropriated by the mad white supremacists like Damien Dement and those guys. But but even in 1080 protests and things, you know, which is where it's first started really popping up a lot. Um, you know, there's a lot of it is a lot of Maori, particularly from rural areas. Um, it is a lot of a lot of tradies on their hogs. <laughs> Um, you know, and it is quite, um, it's not every sector of society, but it is, it's certainly not, um, just one, uh, one demographic profile, which is, 
which is interesting, and it just shows that the misinformation and the conspiracy theories are coming from all angles. Online. I just find it so ironic when you see Pakeha on Facebook and Twitter who are talking about going on a hikoi, <laughs> and you know that they didn't go on a hikoi when it came to foreshore and seabed or you know any of the other five million hikois that we've had <laughs> yeah. over the last how many years? I thought it was good. Did you see when they when they were there, there um, the the hikoi, you know, air quotes um, came up. Uh, you know, was at the Auckland border down by the Bombay Hills, and they presented you know their free citizen of Aotearoa passports or whatever. And I was like, it reminded me of you know all those sort of. Um, you know, there's families on the East Coast who like sort of stop cars and be like, you know, do you want a, you know, a Nati Pado passport? <laughs> you know, like. As far as flags go, one of the interesting things I read yesterday is about how in the Australian protests, the Australian merchant red flag in scene or however you say, or in sign, how do you pronounce it? Ensign? But that's been that's been taken on by the, the kind of sovereignty crew there. So in a way they just kind of look around and find some available iconography. And in this particular case it's 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 also appropriated an entire separate movement. And there is some extremely weird it's just extremely weird to watch people who basically align with alt right white supremacist movements Using the <laughs> independence flights, I, yeah. I find I find it I find it my boggling. Anyway, let's 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 park that. The polls, polls, polls. Three polls have come out in the last few days. Last night we had the one news coma Brunton poll, and then last week we had the what do we call it now? Mills Talbot Mills, formerly UMR poll, and a, a Curia poll for the Taxpayers Union, and they basically. We're in similar sort of territory, showing Labour dropping a couple of points, uh, National gaining tiny bit, uh, David Seymour looking pretty, the Act Party looking pretty strong, and Judith Collins' personal rating remaining at the kind of threshold for if she were a party <laughs> getting into Parliament at all. Ben, tell, 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 give us your give us your poll take. I mean, it's it's one of those, it's. <laughs> Christopher Luxon up to four percent oh, in the uh, Luxon, in the Luxon uh, mania news. sweeping the, the country. Poor Simon Bridges, who's 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 the the story of Simon Bridges re- returning with a giant cloak filled with all of the national caucus from one extreme to the other struggles a bit. with he's got one percent. What does it? What does it? What does it mean? I mean, it's once again one of those things where I think obviously Labour have dropped by you know a considerable amount, and let's not overlook that. But at the same time, we've said it before: it's a it's 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 a matter of when, not if. But surely, at some point, the National Party need to do something. Yeah. So the the key. Takeaway from across those polls uh, was probably uh, the one from the Curia poll, which showed um, for the first time since the GFC, uh, right direction, wrong direction had swung in favour of wrong direction. Mm. So that's you ask people: is the country headed in the right direction or the wrong direction? And that's a that's a pretty good proxy, you know, outside of actual voter intentions for a party. It's a pretty good proxy of um, how people you know, whether people will support the government of the day or not the government of the day uh, when it comes to polling um, because it really sort of, you know, you're asking New Zealanders about the country, but what you're really asking them is how do you feel about your next 12 months, you know? And, yeah, it's, it's pretty significant that, that that's changed. You know, you, you expect these ups and downs, as we've seen. Labor always, Labor always sort of reverts to the mean after after the stirring leadership during a crisis has sort of settled down. They've had an abysmal month, you know, just all over the show in terms of confusing announcements, abandoning plans, backtracking, mixed messages. Um and and that you know there's clear connection to that in the polling, um, which will you know worry them a bit. But that's situational. But but the idea that uh, you know there's this lack of certainty. You know, in the old days, the old days a year ago, we basically knew that if we trusted Jacinda, if we all locked down or whatever, we'd go back to normal. We'd all be enjoying six sixty. Um, 
And now we don't have that certainty. People are more worried about the future. Because, you know, you saw that even when the lockdown started this year, no one was particularly worried. None of the, you know, none of the sort of signs of economic uncertainty or panic or anything was set in. That we got from the first time round. No, yeah, was, because people were like, no, yeah, we know yeah, how yeah, to do yeah. this. Um, and then, and then, but then from then on, and um, again, I don't want to be too stuck record on this, but then there are people on both sides of the government pulling in each direction, mm. whether it's, what the hell are you doing moving out of level four versus what the hell are you doing remaining in level three? Mm. It feels like I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I haven't polled to work out what the numbers have. I'm sure they, they've done that, but it feels like they're kind of forces that are roughly equal <laughs> pulling in those directions, you know. R- Ryan Bridge, who gets a lot of stick because he, you know, does, he does media works, you know, uh, talk back and now he's on the AM show. So he's in that sort of incendiary create. Just debate sort of role, um, but actually a very pretty thoughtful guy. Um, did a great column, I thought, which really summed it up a couple of weeks ago, where he said, "You know, Jacinda Ardern is waiting for the public to tell her what the COVID response is." Um, and you know, but but sort of back to the polling. Yeah, once you remove that. Well, certainty- I think I see. I think I, I would. I'm sorry, we don't want to go on about this, but I think that the mistake was not. When the traffic light thing, or when more probably more importantly, when there was a move away from elimination towards suppression, not doing another big state of the nation mm. serious speech saying this things are really tough. Yeah, this is an incredibly hard decision. I mean, if you go back and listen to her speeches when the first um, when the alert level system was introduced, Stirring she said stuff. we have not had to do this in modern history. Yeah. These are absolutely extreme steps we're taking. I, you know, and I think that needs some acknowledgement. Laying it out, admittedly, people's ears aren't pricked up. As as they were then, so it's harder. But partly that's because of the kind of it becomes wallpaper. Another thing, another thing. I feel like a really big hmm. and explaining that this is a, this, we don't want to do this. This is awful. Yeah. But everyone is going to anyway. Mm. Annabelle, I agree. Oh, well, well, obviously it's not great news for Labor. It's not great news for National. It's really, really bad news for New Zealand First. Um, but I. Th- I was interested to see Chloe appear in the preferred prime minister. Two percent. Two percent in the preferred prime minister for the for the Colmar Brunton poll, and I thought, you know, what's interesting about it is probably when Chloe won Auckland Central, she should have been given some more leadership, more of a leadership position within the Greens. Um, I think that. You know, I realise that there's the whole male-female um, thing in the Greens in terms of leadership. That's mm. right. Are you got to have a male leader and a female leader? Am I correct, or is yeah, it just I, two I, co-leaders? That's right. It's, 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 they haven't. I don't think they've changed it yet. But this, because the moves are yeah. afoot. Because you know, as as is always the case when you try and. <laughs> You know, when you try and be the most progressive person in the room, you know, you find that things change. So male and female. So you're saying get, um, rid of, um, get rid of James Shaw and put, put Chloe in, is that what you're saying? Yeah, mm. it's time for Chloe money. It, um, Especially if they want to win Auckland Central again. People like their MP to be a winner. Yes. That is an absolutely critical seat to them now, I'm just for l- them now. And, I and thought whoever the media, the comms person was in the Greens party that wouldn't let Chloe do the interview... With TVNZ yesterday, should probably. Wait, wait, what was that? What was that? That, that? So TVNZ wanted to interview Chloe about being oh, yeah. a, a, appearing in the preferred prime minister poll. Yeah. They approached Chloe's office. Apparently, Chloe's office said yes. This is Benedict Day, Benedict story. Uh-huh. And well, then, she and she then, yeah, said she was keen. And, keen, and then something. the Greens, Green Party HQ the, said no, no, no. Yeah, said right? no. Wow. Which a is a stupid thing to do if you're wanting to, like, pump up your yeah. party. And secondly, put Martima in a really awkward position because then Benedict says to her, why, why, why weren't we allowed to interview Chloe? So it's like how to take a great news Did story Ma- and completely said, screw said, it up. She should have leaned off, looked off camera and gone, hey, Clint. <laughs> um, there's actually a picture here. I've got a, I've got a grab of the the One News poll with the um, preferred prime minister, and it's got Christopher Luxon right beside Chloe Swarbrick there, four and two, and they look like like we're quite a good power. I'm wondering the, the future of New Zealand. I, I think like Chloe time could be Luxbrook. the Luxbrook. Chloe Lux. could be the leader of National. National has Co-leader. no contenders. Wow. They could bring in Chloe. That could you heard be the it here answer. First, ladies and gentlemen, on Gone by Lunchtime. Speaking of James Shaw, let's touch very briefly on COP26, which rounded up in Glasgow over the weekend with 
sort of uh, kind of clinging on to the idea with a cop of out. We're, well, we're clinging on to the idea of staying within one point five degrees of heating. Uh, the the coal thing was changed. What was it changed from phasing out to phasing down? down. The yeah. request and the, <laughs> I mean, phasing and. Oh, like oh, so many kind of um, brain emissions go into that whole. How are we going to achieve phasing that? Phasing down yeah. feels synergies. like something you'd do on the bridge of the Starship <laughs> Enterprise, eh? Like <laughs> phase down the, the what or, like, or maybe they said we're going to consciously uncouple from coal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that would be the way to do it. I don't know. And we also had, you know, the NDC that New Zealand put forward along with the which is your commitment for, for for reducing seemed like a little bit of a fudge too. And they kind of put on about the eighth paragraph, by the way, we'll achieve this, which was a doubling, if you, depending on the way you look at it, we'll achieve this by buying a whole lot of yeah. credits overseas. And you kind of... I don't know. It's just a talk fest. No, so that? look, I, I, I Rio, understand. Rio, Kyoto, is... Paris, it's just, and yet, and here we are on a blazing hot rock, it's... melting as we hurtle towards the sun and certain death for our tamariki. <laughs> awesome, guys. Thank mm-hmm. you. Yeah. It's, it's, our, nu- work, it's our nuclear mm-hmm. free moment, and that's why I'm donating $20 to Greenpeace <laughs> to protest against the bombs. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it is. It is pretty funny. Like that. That you know, we sort of claim to be this kind of this moral leader on climate change, and then we're like, you know, we'll we'll just we'll just buy an Estonian forest. <laughs> it's yeah. <this> problem solved. <laughs> while, like. while also like importing <laughs> millions of dollars of conflict phosphate to to power mm. our. Mm. Our agricultural industry. Yeah, send, send Shane Jones overseas to, to like inspect, to, you know, but buy a share from Bolsonaro of some Amazon or something like. I, yeah, I don't know. Can we can we go back to the national leadership because the the climate change stuff is just depressing. Um, yeah, very briefly, and then we can then we're done. Yeah, yeah we've got to go. I've I've got, got, go. Quickly, what are you going to say? Go, well, go. I, was, I was just going to say. I mean, yeah, you're right. Uh, it's it's a win, not an if, in terms of national. My understanding is that. The adults in the room who are no longer in the room, but you know the sort of big beasts of the key era, era, um, mm. the golden age, um, are sort of are kind of are kind of putting the hard word on the players that you know things have to be mature. You know, mm. they, they can't be a sort of it can't just be another sort of to scramble like some to in the and top that. of it can't be another Muller, it can't be another Collins Hospital Pass. Mm. It's got to be done in an orderly fashion. It can no, there can only be one challenger, right? Which is probably firming up his bridges. Yeah. He's got to bring everyone else into the fold. Yes. You know, he, he it can't just be bridges wins by two votes. And it's got to be a big yet. It's got to be the whole party behind him, except obviously Collins, who will never give in, no. never relent, never stop coming like the creature from It Follows. But <laughs> um, it feels but, but like that, else. that Drake song, eh? Started at the bottom, no one knew. <laughs> um, so there, and that's probably not going to happen before Christmas, is it? Because De- that just oh. feels messy. I, I think it, I actually look personally. I think it'd probably be a good tactical move because you, if you could do it while you're not getting doorstepped with a new leadership, like you know, you, you want to avoid a repeat of you know that Tova story of the Muller. Oh, I see. So you could at least beat, beat Muller's fifty-four days if you <laughs> fit yeah, the Christmas break into it. Break. <laughs> 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 but, um, but, but you know, but there, look, there's no hurry. Remember this, you know, because what they'll be keeping an eye on is that right direction, wrong direction. The fact that the sheen has come off Labour, that mm. you know, COVID is no longer the vote winner uh, it was because COVID is in the community, and they'll be thinking we've got two years to two years still to get it right. And you know, a lot of water can grow under the bridge, so it's better to have a good transition bridge. than a fast transition right now. And about, do you have any final thoughts for us related to pigeons, national leaders, uh, climate change? I've got nothing. So I left everything on the floor. I've laid everything out here today. There's nothing. You really have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Um, uh, thank you, Ti, here for bearing with us today and um, distancing us so effectively. Thank you, especially to the spin-off members, especially the spin-off members who have made it all the way to this final gasp of the podcast as it exhales. Goodbye. 
you find it hard staying optimistic with all the financial news in the media? I'm Bernard Hickey, and on my podcast, When the Facts Change, I'm here to help you navigate the ever-changing landscape of economics in Aotearoa. So join the conversation every Friday on When the Facts Change, brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network in partnership with KiwiBee. Are you curious about how business can be better? I'm Simon Pound, and I host Business is Boring, a podcast where I caught it all with some of the most interesting people in entrepreneurship, commerce, and making things happen. Tune in to Business is Boring every Tuesday, brought to you by the Spin Off Podcast Network in partnership with Smart Business Lab. The Spin Off Podcast Network.